There's a certain irony to using the latest and greatest digital video and digital cinema cameras to record things I know about film photography and sharing them with you. And that's not lost on me. In fact, over the last few years, I've been trying to find ways to scratch that itch of refining my skills with motion, but adding film to it. And that solution's been under my nose for the last hundred plus years. Today, I wanna to take you along on my journey into working with motion picture films, specifically with this guy here, the Arflex 16 standard. Hey there, and welcome to Sub Miniature Sunday, Sunny 16, Matt Mirage's movie making magic. We gotta workshop the title a little bit. But anyway, I'm your host, Matt Mirage. This is gonna be less of a how-to series because I'm really getting started in this format. I've only been in it a year. I'm certainly no expert in this side of film photography, but I am practicing a lot with it and I wanna share my results as well as things I've learned along the way that maybe I didn't find as easily online. It's different enough that I think it can be intimidating and there are certain things that remind me of my time in medium and large format film photography, which sounds kind of funny because we're not really talking a really big piece of film here. To really tell the story about how I dove into 16 millimeter, we need to jump back to March of 2022. March was a pretty impactful month because it's when I left my job at Midwest Photo, I started to do freelance and I also had a little bit of time to start going to some meetups that I hadn't really been on in a long time. The first meetup I now had some time to attend was the Dark Rooms Film Roundup in Joshua Tree, California. It was a really cool time and there were a few different photo walks as well as some beers and cameras meetups. At two of those beers and cameras meetups, I got to meet YouTuber Bray Hunziger. Bray's an awesome guy and a prolific film photographer and one of his most popular YouTube videos is one on how to get started in 16 millimeter film. Prior to meeting Bray at the Beers and Cameras events, I had never even considered 16 millimeter film, but he just so happened to be there with his behemoth K3 or Krasnogorsk 3 camera. A pretty neat, not so little camera, and uh, I'll just let this photo here do the talking. Yeah, that is not the face of someone who's thinking rationally. You can see the exact moment the gas or gear acquisition syndrome sets in. So I went away from that event worried about my 8x10 film and all, all the other stuff that was in my head, but in the back of my mind, the seed had been planted for 16 millimeter. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I found myself driving to Cleveland to meet up with the rest of my buddies at the Film Photography Podcast to do some mass recording for like the spring and summer season. I usually go out to FPP not every few weeks, uh, but a few times a year to do some large bulk recordings of topics and then we'll phone in stuff as news develops. While I was there, my buddy Mike Rosso, host of the FPP, had the bright idea to let's film a whole episode about motion picture film. Normally when Mike gets all jazzed about this sort of thing, I snooze off or start eating snacks or reading listener letters, just something else because that concept is totally boring to me. But this time around, everybody was really shooting. They were passing around some eight millimeter cameras. There was some 16 millimeter cameras going around. And I was like, yeah, this can be, this can be pretty cool. And while they were recording one segment on eight millimeter film, Mike just hands me like this brown oval of a camera. The camera was a Keystone A7 Criterion Deluxe camera. And one, if you've listened to FPP, Mike talks about a lot. It's like a really inexpensive thing. It was a wild experience because the camera, you, the viewfinder were just like approximated things. You have to like scale focus it. And I had no idea what I was doing. But when I pressed that shutter button on there, Ooh, it had kind of like this purring feeling. I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. I can see why people would be about this. But Mike, isn't like 16 millimeter film expensive? And he's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. We send the film in and we do what we do scans at FPP. Okay, so now, now I'm really thinking, okay, so maybe I can, maybe I can make this work. And pretty much all the rest of that FPP recording, there was some motion picture film being shot or talked about. And normally after marathon recording days at FPP, I just pass out in my hotel room. I sleep anywhere from like 12 to 13 hours to get up and do it all over again. Not so much this time. Now I was into hyper-focus mode. It's, it's motion picture time. By the second day of FPP recordings and another episode talking a little bit about motion picture film, I had already binged at least six hours of 16 millimeter film content, including Bray's videos uh, and, and a whole bunch of other resources, just trying to figure out, okay, what are the different film formats? What cameras are affordable? What's market price? What was market price a few years ago? Where do we think it's gonna go? These are all, yeah, the hyper-focusing is real and I was in full research research mode, it was, nothing was gonna stop me at this point. By the end of that FPP weekend, I was sure of two things. 
I was gonna have a 16 millimeter camera soon. I didn't know what it was, but because of the internet, it was probably gonna be either a K3 or a Bolex, both mechanical spring wound cameras. So I made it through April without making any dumb decisions. And then early in May, my buddy, Mr. Steven Takis, texted me and asked if I wanted to go to the Ohio Camera Collector Society auction, or OCCS. Every year in early May, they have this big camera auction. And while there is film and digital, it's mostly like older collectible film cameras. There's usually so many items at these auctions, it feels like you're squeezing through like a storage facility because there's just so much stuff. And while I was trying to snake my way through some really big cameras, I just felt a thump and I almost hit the ground, tripping over this giant silver case. When I looked down to catch myself, I noticed this really large black blob, but it also looked kind of familiar. I immediately snapped a photo with my cell phone and sent it off to Mike Rosso and asked, hey, is this something I should bid on? So all I remember after that point is I got a text back from Mike saying go for it, and it's a little fuzzy from there. When I came to, the briefcase was in one hand, a receipt was in the other, and there was even a few other resellers that were congratulating me on my purchase. That's how I really knew I messed up. If you've not worked with motion picture film before, there's four basic gauges or sizes of film you can work with. And this is just based on how far across those films are. You've got eight millimeter films, 16 millimeter films, 35 millimeter films, and large format, which encompasses 65 and 70 millimeter films. The one I'm gonna be spending a lot of time talking about today is 16 millimeter film because that's what the RE takes. Now, 16 millimeter film actually dates back all the way to 1923. That's right, this year in 2023, 16 millimeter film celebrates its centennial, 100 years of this film format. Now this is one of the two available sizes in 16 millimeter film that are available. This is a 100 foot, what's known as daylight spool. If you've shot with medium format film before, this will look kind of similar. Medium format film has a plastic roll that's slightly larger than the area of the film, so light doesn't, uh, doesn't get all the way in and ruin your film. In addition to 100 foot daylight loads, 16 millimeter film is also available in what is known as Encore. This is a 400 foot load. It doesn't have a daylight reel. Well, they do make them, but they're super rare. It comes on this plastic core, which needs to be loaded into a specific 16 millimeter film magazine. Not all cameras will take 400 foot loads, but pretty much every 16 millimeter camera will take 100 foot loads. And while my RE did come with magazines, we are not gonna get there. I've only ever worked with the magazine once, and it's gonna take me some time to get the confidence and really shoot with a lot of this film uh, to feel like I'm ready to talk about it. So we have 100 foot loads and 400 foot loads for 16 millimeter film, but now we also have to consider the perforations. Most 16 millimeter films that are available new today will come in what is known as single perf, meaning there is a single sprocket hole um, along the right hand side of the film as it runs through the camera. There are also a lot of older cameras out there, many of these cameras prior to the 1950s, which were made for taking double perforated film. Double perforated film typically goes in cameras that expose a standard 16 millimeter image. If you have a much newer camera, it can take both, but you probably just want single perf. And if you have an older camera that takes double perf film, you cannot put single perf film through it. It will wreck the camera because there's gonna be teeth that are looking for a hole that isn't there. Don't worry, they'll make one. So in addition to lengths of film and the type of perforations of film, we also have the different standards of 16 millimeter capture. For the first 40 or so years, standard 16 millimeter conformed to a four by three aspect ratio. Coming in the later 1960s, we also had super 16 millimeter, which made use of that now wider opening because the film was transporting with a single perforation instead of a double. So we just widen that area to a now 1.66 aspect ratio, and you're getting a lot more real estate on a piece of 16 millimeter film. You also have ultra 16 millimeter, which is about as wide as super 16, but it's a little bit shorter than Super 16, meaning it's giving you slightly more area than standard, but less than Super 16. And it's closer to the native 16 by nine aspect ratio that we mostly use today. So with a little bit more background on 16 millimeter, let's talk about the RE 16S. This is a camera line that started in the early 1950s and went all the way to the 1980s. It was one of RE's longest runs and they made over 20,000 of these cameras. In their heyday, they were huge for use in sports, news, documentary, and they're even still used today in some film schools because of the work of diligent RE techs and passionate hobbyists. 
This is a camera, because it was around so long, there was a lot of modifications done to these cameras and a lot of upgrades over time. The base model of this camera is available with this, what's called divergent turret. It allows you to have three lenses on at a time. And when you want to change your shot, you just push the turret and now you have a new lens. The lenses that this camera takes are what are known as RES or RE standard mount. And they have just this little coupling which tightens on this metal circle here. The lenses sit on in this little coupling and these two little switches on the top just pinch to open it. It feels like it shouldn't hold, but the tension fit has done well for longer than I've been alive. Because this is a slightly newer model of the RF Flex 16, also known as the SB, B for bayonet mount, there is also one stainless steel ring that has these two extra little pits here, and that's to take the larger, sometimes heavier, RFlex bayonet mount. One thing that really drew me to the RFlex is that this is not only a camera that allows me three lenses, it's also a reflex design camera. So when I'm looking through this lens right here, there is a ground glass and an eyepiece. So everything that I am seeing is exactly what the film is seeing. And the way this camera does it is pretty ingenious. There is, in addition to the turret, there is a rotating mirror shutter. So in here, there is a mirror and I can move this little inching knob and I can rotate this little bow tie mirror in here. These cameras are electronically driven and depending on the motor that you get with them, that's gonna determine your available frames per second. These cameras came with either variable speed or constant speed motors. And it's really awesome. You can really upgrade capability based on what type of motor you get. The one that came with my Ari is a 24 frames per second, which is awesome because over in the US, 24 frames a second or the NTSC standard is the way to go. Another important thing to consider when you're looking into a 16 millimeter camera is whether or not the camera is what's known as sync sound. This uses what's known as a wild motor. So one that is pretty close to accurate, but not gonna be frame accurate for recording sound. But that doesn't matter too much because just give this shutter a listen. Another term used to describe how loud this camera is, is what's known as MOS, or Mit Out Sound. Basically, it's a silent movie camera because if you try to record dialogue, it's gonna be pretty loud. The camera also has available this compendium shade, which allows me to add on filters, and it has this little hot shoe attachment that slides in. It's got a little tension fit. This camera does tip the scales at around 11 pounds, which is just shy of my eight x 10 view camera, but it's surprisingly ergonomic. This little pit right here is for my thumb. I can also focus using these little metal leaves that are available on all the lenses, which makes handheld operation possible. I don't wanna say like comfortable because this thing does get heavy, but it's quite possible. Because this camera has a reflex mirror, uh, the door is probably one of the most sensitive things on here. You can't really jerk this around too much because the ground glass where all your focusing takes place is in the door. So you really don't wanna slam this down or, or be like really, really bossy with it. Inside the camera, we have these two little gears and those are for placing my 100 foot loads of film. Film's gonna get loaded around here through this drive and then it's going to get loaded behind this pressure plate and expose it in front of the gate. And that's gonna load onto here, and then I press my switch, and that's gonna run film through it. So even though some of the most popular 16 millimeter cameras that you'll see people talking about are mechanical and spring wound cameras, this is actually a very early electronic camera. When I opened the box and looked at the power cable that was in there, it was uh, sketchy at best. So I need to figure out a power solution for this very, very outdated motor. How am I gonna do that? Well, I knew it took eight volts and I knew the big one is the positive and the small one's the negative. And that's kind of all I had to go on. So even though my power cable was broken and old power cables were meant for like really older battery packs and battery belts, I wanted to see if there was a way I could use modern batteries to power this camera without like frying anything. So the solution I found was a 3D printed plug adapter for the RE16S. It's just a top and bottom 3D printed piece. I found in the electronics section of my local home improvement store, some of these little banana plug adapters and two of those got glued in, a larger one for the large plug and a smaller one for the small plug. And then I wired those up to this little barrel adapter, which would then fit 
my batteries. Now the batteries I use for a lot of things, including the camera I'm recording this with, are these giant Sony NPF 970, 980 style batteries. They have quite a bit of capacity, and I also noticed that Small Rig sold this little adapter here, which has little barrel plug adapters. One has 12 volt, the other one has 7.4 or pretty close to eight volt. So when I slide this guy into the bottom of the adapter, light's gonna go on and I can put my barrel adapter in one side to the 7.4 volt and the other side into the Ari and I'm in business. So with the camera powered on and confirmed working, I also got in the mail a congratulatory roll of FPP black and white 100 16 millimeter film. Mike was so generous to send that and it even had a note, hey Matt, congrats on the new camera processing's on me, which, wow, that's awesome. So I can actually test the camera and make sure it was all working properly. Just like working in medium and large format stills film, this camera has an incredible number of limitations versus the current digital medium. Now in this particular camera, because I have a 24 frames per second motor, that means when I'm running film through the camera at that rate, 100 feet of film is gonna give me roughly two minutes and 45 seconds. Because of the rotating 180 degree mirror shutter and my 24 frames per second motor, I only have one effective shutter speed and that's 1 50th of a second on my meter. So my shutter speed's locked. Whatever film I load in here, I'm pretty much locked to that. So locked ISO, locked shutter speed, my only real exposure controls on this are my ability to control aperture and add filters in front of the lens. Without the use of this two-stop neutral density and this 85B filter, I would have had to shoot at like F16, F22 the whole time. And for a few shots, honestly, that could have benefited it. But uh, here's what I ended up with. When I took a look at the finished files, I was ecstatic with what I saw. Yeah, there was a little bit of jitteriness because I'm not used to hand holding this thing yet, but it was just so cool to see. And one of my favorite things about working in 16 is it is grainy. It is imperfect, just like all other film. You know, I grew up in the 90s when a lot of things were on like tape and CD and stuff. So I didn't really have the chance to experience too much of like home movies. And our, we had a Polaroid family. We didn't do a lot of home movies. So when I look at footage shot with this camera, it feels like I'm watching a memory. And before you say, oh, you know, there's look packs and things to make it look like 16 millimeter film. Yeah, we've had film simulations for stills and motion for a long time, but there is just something different about all of those limitations. And when it comes together, man, it's a lot of fun. So with one successful roll down, I went to load another roll at a 4th of July celebration with the family. And all of a sudden, the camera didn't work anymore. I decided it was time to send it in for a CLA. It probably needed it anyway because it's been 30 years. So I sent it in to do all camera in New Jersey. They're only about an hour from my buddy Mike at FPP and they did an excellent job. 
They had the camera for less than a week and it was on its way back to me and they did a complete overhaul of the camera. They gave it a full clean lubricate adjust or CLA. They collimated the lenses, which is aligning the lenses and making sure what you see is actually what you get. And I paid a couple of bucks extra on that service to have them convert it to a more modern electronic standard, which is 12 volt. So now instead of taking this weird two pin deal, you can see they sealed that up right there. They converted it to a four pin XLR. When Dual had this in for conversion, they also called me and let me know, hey, electronically, this camera is doing great. I don't know what you were using to run it. And then I let them know about my battery solution. And they said, oh, it wasn't getting enough juice. While the, I was running the right voltage through here, I wasn't running enough amperage. This is an older, heftier camera, and it takes a lot more amperage to run the motor. Think of it like your car battery. It needs more cold cranking amps to get that thing moving. So I just needed a little bit more forward amperage to make it work. So with a little bit of Googling, some DI work with a soldering iron, and this Talent Cell 12 volt battery off of Amazon, I was able to get some good consistent power to this camera, and it's been running great for me ever since. And with that, just what the heck are you up to, Matt? I don't have any big notions of making like a motion picture or anything with this, but it is really, really nice to be a beginner again. It's exciting because it's territory I haven't played around in, and while I have found myself on like commercial video gigs, for like advertisement, I haven't done too much in the like filmmaking realm. And technically, yes, this is filmmaking, but right now I'm just having fun making home movies. I took the RFLEX with me on vacation back in October of 2022. And when we were down on Thai B, it was a blast to follow Lauren and the dogs around as we walked to the beach, waking up early to catch some of the sunrise and catch the waves blowing over and just see some beautiful light. It's fun to experiment again with films I already know in the stills world, but to see how they react in this much smaller, technically sub-miniature format. It's a lot of fun. I'm having a blast and it's probably because of the novelty of it and because of the limitations that I'm used to from medium and large format, but this, it's silly, but this camera feels so much like shooting large format to me, but the end result is, it's a little bit different and you really have to be into it. In fact, by the time you're done paying for processing and scanning on this film, 16 millimeter isn't too much more than Super 8. Now, as far as cameras go, yeah, this is going a little bit more on the spendy route, especially if you're just gonna be doing home movies. You can start with 16 millimeter cameras much cheaper, but you can also spend much, much more in 16 millimeter. Because it's pulling physical feet footage of film through the camera, you're using a lot of resources to make it happen. Shooting 16 millimeter film is not cheap and I do have my buddy Michael Rosso at the Film Photography Project to blame. They can scan 16 millimeter film, give you ProRes files, they can give you raw 16 millimeter, also known as DPX files, up to 4K. It's, uh, it's pretty neat stuff. Again, take everything I'm saying here through the eyes of a very excited beginner. This is all the film I've run through here so far. So to the still shooters, this probably looks like a lot of film, but to you motion shooters, you're like, you're just getting started, pal, because it's not a lot of film. In fact, this is less than I can get on this little 64 gigabyte card. So think about that when you're trying to price out working in 16 millimeter. This is certainly not gonna be the last episode in this series, and I plan to share more of my experiences as I make them with this camera. If you have any questions about 16 millimeter film, I'll do my best to put you in the right direction to it. But I do recommend checking out Bray's channel and his tutorial on 16 millimeter, as well as a few others I'm gonna link in the description below. And also be sure to check out the Film Photography Project. I've been with FPP for years. I suppose this is kind of sponsored because FPP did comp me the film and process and scan on that first roll. So go ahead and take a look over there. There's a lot of great options for your new and vintage 16 mil cameras. I never would have in a million years thought I would be into sub-miniature format and actually enjoying it, but this has been a blast. I can't wait to show you even more of what I've been up to, but we have to start somewhere, so consider this just the beginning.